good enough. That's some discipline. That's some discipline. You're listening to Heart Beat Radio. This is Bob Johnson again, coming live from the Heart Beat Radio studios right here in Calgary, Alberta, Canada. Uh, we got a really interesting show in, uh, coming up for this evening. We're actually going to be having the uh, host of our show uh, will be our guest this evening uh, in conversation with... Uh, wrestling historian Matt Mers from Portland Wrestling. Always a pleasure to be here with you, Bob Johnson. Thank you for all you do to help preserve professional wrestling history here on Heartbeat Radio. People out there don't realize that Bob Johnson is instrumental in uh, the success of this show. You should see him at places like CAC and the Professional Wrestling Hall of Fame down in Wichita Falls, Texas. Uh, He works his butt off to find guests for this show and to help preserve the history of professional wrestling for future generations to discover. This will be a really interesting conversation, you in conversation with our special guest this evening, the one and only Bruce Hart, and welcome, Bruce, to Heartbeat Radio. Uh, Thanks very much, Bob. I'm looking forward to uh, conversing with uh, my friend. You're very much a man of mystery in professional wrestling. Uh, WWE doesn't seem to like to talk about you that much, yet you seem (laughs) to kind of linger around. Uh, in their minds, nonetheless, and I'm interested in finding out a lot more oh, yeah, about a lot of dyna- your history. Yeah, a lot of uh, dynamics, you know, it's kind of uh, been interesting, albeit frustrating, and uh, but yeah, I, I, I don't mind uh, setting the record straight and kind of illuminating people about some of the uh, whatever the hell. <laughs> <laughs> Well, let me get right into it, Bruce. Now, the speculation online is that you were born January 13, 1950, in Great Falls, Montana, of all places, making you a dual citizen of America and Canada. Is that true? Yeah, I was born in the U.S. of A., and and at that time, Montana was sort of more uh, kind of thriving than... uh, Alberta, you know, and they had an oil boom in the early 50s up in uh, Alberta. My dad was originally from Edmonton, so he uh, he had started his promotion in Edmonton, uh, oddly enough, in 1948, and he, and he was kind of headquartered in Montana. It was a long run from Calgary to, I mean, from Great Falls to Edmonton, and he actually wasn't at running in Calgary in at that time, he started Calgary. I think he acquired it in 1952. And, then, and did he uh, already own the Hart House that's, you know, famous amongst wrestling historians? I and think fans? He, he purchased that in, in uh, around the end of 51. So he ended up uh, moving to Calgary, which is sort of halfway between uh, Montana and uh, Edmonton. Edmonton's farther north. It's a couple of And at miles. that time, it would have just been been Stu and Helen, and then you and Smith. Is that correct? And Keith. Yeah, it was kind of a steady stream after that. About every year, there was <laughs> another. Uh, <laughs> Stu was a busy man. Born. So there ended up being twelve, as most people know, and uh, with Owen being the uh, so-called baby. But uh, but yeah, it was. Uh, it was kind of a fascinating, uh, you know, uh, retrospective. Uh, you're just growing up around the, uh, I've, I've sort of alluded to it in the past in uh, some of my writings and just some of the, but uh, I remember we were sort of out in the country in this uh, weird, it was kind of a, a big old brick house. Some people would call it a mansion. It was real, but um, a lot of people speculated that it was some kind of a haunted house so we were, we were kind of like a, a cross as I've pointed out between the uh, the Beverly Hillbillies and the Adams family <laughs> most of the neighbors are pretty conservative back in that day and there was this I remember every, every Saturday morning the uh, the wrestlers would uh, come up to the house to get their uh, paychecks and get their itinerary for the week and uh Back back in 
that era, uh, there was this bizarre procession, uh, you know, of uh, you know bald-headed Nazis and Russians and <laughs> black guys <laughs> with white hair like Sweet Daddy Seeky and uh, freaks like Hay- Haystack Calhoun and Little Beaver and Sky Lolo and all this kind of <laughs> and. Back then, there I don't think we were even on TV yet. So the fan, you know, these neighbors and whoever, you know, uh, were intrigued with this bizarre kind of uh, collection of <laughs> these very strange-looking characters. And then uh, adding to it was the house kind of looked like some kind of a haunted uh, Adams family house, but. My dad was kind of a country boy, so he had like goats and cows and chickens and stuff all running around the yard too. So it was uh, like some you know pre precursor of the Beverly Hillbillies and the Adams Family and uh, that well, type of thing. Couldn't help you know. with screams coming from the basement, I would think. Yeah, and adding to it was my mother was uh, she was from New York City and she was you know uh, not the least bit. Uh, thrilled with being transplanted into the uh Alberta at that time was kinda of like uh it wasn't it wasn't really uh you know, a metropolis like it might be today, but it was more like a you know, kind of a in the middle of uh the wild, wild west, you know, so it was it was a, uh an interesting uh <laughs> to say the least. Is it true she was in a car accident while she was pregnant with you? Yeah, um, yeah. There was some woman who was drunk. Who uh, I think my it was down in Montana, and uh, my dad was hit head on. Uh, my I think my mother was about six months pregnant. So I uh, I think my mother was almost killed. I was almost miscarried, or whatever the word for it was. And then wow. she was in the hospital for about three months. Be- uh, before she had me, and leading up to when she had, and I think she uh, she had like every bone in her face broken, and her skull fractured, and a bunch of other uh, injuries. So she was so traumatized by that, <laughs> she never ever drove a car after that. So she she was kind of stuck up in the uh, Adams family, the house <laughs> at that time, which was about uh, ten miles outside of town. So we were. Uh, so she was sort of like, uh, you know, sequestered up there with the chickens and the cows. And the only time she ever got out was when Stu would uh, would drive her somewhere, you know. Now let me let me set the record straight on something, Bruce. Is your real name Bruce Ambrose Edwardius Hart, or are you Bruce Dennis Luis Hart? Oh, it's funny as I told you guys before. There's so much uh, misinformation, and I don't know where that. You know, horse shit about Dennis Luis. I don't know. Or I think that I know my brothers are always ribbing and shit. You know, so, <laughs> and that that's I, I think part of the uh, the dynamic these days with the internet. You know, you can uh, plant any kind of shit. You know, that uh, good or bad. You know, and uh, half the stuff on there I I surmise to be bullshit. You know, I sort of laugh. When I read some of the bullshit supposedly about not only me but other members of the Hart family or just people I've known in Stampede, and you just sort of shake your head and say, "Who makes up this shit?" You know. Uh, <laughs> now, now tell me about high school. Did you uh, did you play any sports in high school, Bruce? Yeah, we all did the amateur wrestling and that type of thing, and uh, then I was probably better at football than wrestling. You know, I was. Uh, pretty decent uh, quarterback and that kind of thing, you know, and then my dad had played football and he was he's involved in a lot of sports, so we kind of uh, that's about all we did out, you know, we didn't have we were out in the country <laughs> so we were always out with the ball or of course we were down in the dungeon quite a bit when we were kids we mostly just would sneak down there and watch these horror shows with the uh the guys getting stretched is my dad you know, let's talk about stretched. some of the guys that were that you grew up 
kind of you know, literally looking up to as a little kid. You had uh, Archie Gouldy, Ripper Collins was up there. Um, oh, some of the guys from I know, way back. Uh, George and Sandy like, Scott, Luther Lindsay, uh, all those guys. Uh, Bill Miller, Dan Miller, uh, Johnny Valentine, uh, um, Gino Morella, better known as Gorilla Monsoon. Um, uh, Fritz von Erich was up there on breaking in when we were kids. He, he actually lived in a trailer in my dad's yard, and they used to go on the road. And I remember Fritz's wife, Doris von Erich, was... Um, she she was living in the trailer besides beside the house, and she would come in and uh, commiserate with my mother, <laughs> like two wrestling <laughs> wives who were stranded away from home. You know, and, but I remember a lot of the lady wrestlers were up there breaking in, Penny Banner and Lorraine Johnson, who was uh, later married to Nick Roberts, who was also up there at that time, and... Um, Joe Blanchard, Gene Kaniski, Wilbur Snyder, guys like that broke in up there. Back then, a lot of the black guys couldn't get work in the States. It was kind of a, a bit like the Jackie Robinson era. There was a lot of racial tensions where they, they just didn't like to wrestle in the States because it was, uh, you know, kind of too dangerous. So I remember so many of the black guys, some of the best black guys ever were up there regularly, like Sweet Daddy and... Bearcat Wright and uh, uh, Shag Thomas, Luther Lindsay, um, uh, later on Abdullah. You know, and those are like the uh, among the best black guys ever, and they they were all up there for extended periods. And Archie was up there; he he got the, the shit stretched out of him uh, on many an occasion. Before my dad kind of um, later on, he became a huge star up there but he, he was uh down there you know getting mauled and i remember my dad had a bunch of these old um legendary shooters a guy named george gordianko and uh luther Lindsay was up there a lot um gordon nelson and um those guys were among the uh you know most kind of feared shooters uh in the in the history of the business, and uh, it was kind of a, at the time we were little kids and we'd go down there and watch this kind of uh, mayhem or whatever the hell you want to call it, but uh, I remember uh, you'd see these big football players, and that seemed to be the ones that were the uh, most, uh, you know, the ones that were considered the, you know, the big fish that uh, and I remember the guys like uh, Wayne Coleman coming down there and getting stretched, and Angelo Mosca and guys like that. You know, and it it was uh, hard hard to describe to see these big guys. You know, big you know guys who were later on perceived to be you know serious ass kickers getting uh, you know put through their paces by. Mm -hmm. Like Stu and Lindsay and Gordienko and anybody that has any idea of the history or the of the business at that time, you know those those are kind of names that uh, nobody wanted to mess with. Uh, guys like Stu and Gordienko and Lindsay and all them and back in that day, you know, and, and it was kind of an interesting uh, kind of uh, baptismal for us as kids. When you watch guys like that, like let's say Archie Gouldy, get, you know, getting getting sugar holded down in your basement, what was your perception as a child when they get in the ring? Did you believe that that was also as legitimate as what was happening in your basement? It's funny, you know, uh, it was a strange charade because uh, back in that era it was uh, – strict kayfabe is, you know, I'm not sure if people even know that term anymore, but uh, so uh, my dad was adamant that uh, even, I remember when the wrestlers used to come up to the house to uh, get their checks and all, um, the bad guys, the heels, had to uh, sequester themselves in one part of the house behind closed doors and the faces uh in another, my dad was adamant to them, like he didn't want them uh, exposing or, you know, 
anything like that, the business, to his kids. And so let me ask you this then, Bruce. Who were the men in the basement doing the stretching? Were those heels? Were those faces? At that time, How did they he were. Uh, mix that. Like mo- most of the guys stretching them were faces, like Lindsey Gorienko, Stu. Okay. And th- th- most of them were faces, but um, and, you know, uh, and back then TV was just getting started, so uh, we didn't. Uh, even really have any preconception of uh, who was heel or face or any of that, you know. Uh, you got started in '71, is that correct, Bruce? Yeah, I uh, when I was starting, I uh, one of the one of the prevailing uh, issues with Stu was uh, size. It's funny, none of us, uh, including Brett, you know, when he started, uh, you know, we were all kind of skinny, and uh, there was a little bit of. Uh, you know, some of the smaller guys in Los Angeles, there was some of the smaller Mexican type guys. And they were kind of mid card or under card. And uh, my dad told me that uh, Oklahoma had a so called junior heavyweights with Leroy McGurk, who was kind of a, not that big himself. And uh, they had the so called junior heavyweight belt, but that was almost. It was the world junior heavyweight belt with, I think, prior to Danny Hodge, it was uh, like Angelo Savoldi and uh, Johnny Swenski and guys like that. But um, the business was pretty much of a heavyweight industry then. And um, I remember when I, I went to England in 1977, you know, I had been kind of half over in Calgary. Just, I was more like kind of a you know, a teen idol type or something like the girls liked me and that, that stuff. But um, I never really got much of a push. You know, it was more like a, kind of a mid-card. And I remember that we had some other guys who were mid-card, you know, who were actually pretty good workers that became half-stars later on, like uh, Rick Martell was a guy I spent a lot of time with training at that time. And uh, there was a couple of others that were not that big, you know, that Jacques Rucho, who you know, at that time was called Jimmy Rucho, you know. We, we were all not, not bad, uh, actually not bad performers, but, you know, we were perceived to be kind of small. So as a consequence, we were mostly uh, chewed up and spit out type thing, but... Uh, now I'd like to go back to 1971 when you when you first started training in the dungeon. Who was actually handling uh, tr- your training, Bruce? Was it your father or was it some of these other men? One of the guys who I really uh, give the most credit to was this old. He was an old uh, Mexican wrestler named Frank Butcher, real name Francisco Garcia. But um, uh, my dad wasn't. I don't think he took me all that seriously, but around that time he let me referee some matches on the road just to uh, get my foot in the door, get you know, make a few bit of walking around money, and uh, that proved to be a tremendous learning experience. Just traveling on the road, and uh, oddly enough, I later on spoke to people like Terry Funk and all, and they told me they always used to referee matches and do stuff like that when they were young punks, you know, for Dory Sr. or whatever, but um, I actually picked up a lot about the, uh, just about the inner workings of the business from that, and then uh, I kind of got this old uh, Frank Butcher to start training me in the dungeon, and uh, there's a couple of other guys, I I know one of our main, he was kind of a mid-card heel for us, a guy named Michelle Martell, and he uh, he asked if he could have his kid brother, who was uh, his real name's Richard Vignal, but uh, so he brought him out, and uh, that was Rick Martell. I was good friends with him, and he was like one of the main guys. I was kind of my main sparring partner. With, you know, we'd go down in the dungeon, and this old Frank Butcher would be uh, putting us through our paces, and we've got a few more. Uh, local wannabes and we mostly would kind of put them through bumps but every now and then uh some of these old veterans my dad would have would would come down uh some old guy named tiger tomaso or i remember the odd time dory funk jr came down there and harley and uh they would give you some pretty 
valuable insights and you get these veterans and you just be picking their brains and saying, what about this or should I, you know, you know, what's the best way to get heat and what's the best way to interact and that all kind of uh, served a great purpose. So when I finally had my debut, uh, which was a main event, I remember, and, uh, you know, I, I got over way better than anyone thought, you know, they're like, geez, how does he, uh, he seems to have an innate sense of the, uh, ring psychology and uh, how to react to a crowd and things like that. And it was mostly from having been around all those guys and even when I was refereeing that, you know, that, that, I would recommend that to a lot of young guys breaking in and spend some time refereeing because you're right in on the action and yet you're not real, there's no real pressure on you because you're not the uh, center of attention and yet you're seeing what's getting over, what's not getting over, and how they're reacting to anything. And, and so those all th- those things all uh, were of huge benefit as far as, uh, you know, kind of understanding. And the big secret of being a great worker, I've said it many a times, is uh, a lot of the little subtleties more than the, uh, you know, the supposed big things. It's these little subtle things about knowing when to do something and when not to and, uh, you know, how to pause for effect here and there and, uh, you know, slow it down and speed it up at the right time and and sort of understanding that it's an interactive thing more than an individual thing where it's more about getting your opponent over than yourself. And if you kind of get your opponent over then stands to reason he's going to be more inclined to get you over and if you get both if you both get each other over then chances are the match will get over and the fans are going to react and it's, it's all things like that you know and those were a lot of the things that enhanced my ability later on when I was breaking in guys like Ben Juan and Davey and Pillman and Owen and uh, those are a lot of the things you know from my perspective now when I see uh, some of the things going on in the WWE I sort of shake my head and say uh, you know they're missing those you know key components you know uh, you know explaining ring psychology and understanding the interactive elements you know about a heel and a face and uh, you know building to a climax and uh you know, the cell sets up the comeback and, you know, things like that, which are, which in my day were the, uh, the foundation of everything, you know, and I you see, you see these things now and you sort of shake your head and saying, uh, it's too damn bad. There's not more grassroots promotions where, uh, guys are actually learning those things. There's only a few guys and most of them I might add are, uh, you know, second generation or guys who have, Growing up in the business, guys like maybe Randy Orton and uh, Bray Wyatt and guys like that, you, you sort of see them and you go, uh, you know, it's pretty obvious that they're maybe their dad or you know, whoever has instilled or imparted those things to them. But, um, but yeah, that that's uh, maybe a long-winded <laughs> answer. <to that. laughs> well, let me ask you, how long did you train and referee before Stu finally gave you a match? I had probably trained about a year with uh, Martel and uh, a few other guys that people probably don't know their names. But um, as I said before, my dad was kind of, I don't think he even took us, me and Martel, seriously. We were both skinny, you know, kind of look like long-haired, skinny, young punks who had, you know, not to be taken seriously. And uh, But I remember I sort of, you know, kind of pestering my dad, and I think he finally uh, said, "Okay, I'll let you uh, have a match or something." And, then, and next thing, uh, I think my dad's booker at that time was an old veteran named Joe Tiger Tomaso, and he uh, he said he had some storyline in in mind with uh, me and this. I think our main top heel at that time was a, a British heel who wore a mask named it sounds funny with the name Kendo Nagasaki which is, sounds like a Japanese name but like a samurai type thing but but he, he was a huge star in England so he was like our top heel and uh, 
And when oh, yeah, he, think, I've always wondered, when he cut a promo, did he cut a promo with a British accent, or did he try to pretend he was a Jap, or what was the deal there? He never ever spoke. He had a British manager named uh, Lord Sloan, who was so every he wore this like samurai type. Uh, it was like an authentic samurai looking outfit with the. I think it was straight from Japan. He had the uh, like some kind of thing out of like the old uh, the like one of these masks with steel grates across the face. And, uh, yeah, yeah, had yeah. A big samurai sword and and. Uh, but anyway, to make a long story short, we shot the angle. I think it was a tag match with me and uh, another heel, uh, baby face I made named Dan Crawford, who was kind of the inventor of the uh, ladder match. And uh, we uh, shot the angle with uh, me and uh, Crawford against Nagasaki and his manager, this Lord Sloan. And uh, it all got over. I think we sold out. It was a haircut versus mask match. <laughs> I remember I uh, had to get my head shaved after my very first match, you know, and I was kind of at that time like the, uh, kind of like a teeny bopper idol, you know, the long blonde hair and all like that. And uh, it, it got over, and uh, I kind of launched my career, and I got pretty uh, pretty decent reviews, you know, and, uh, and kind of to a degree changed my dad's outlook a bit because uh, he was uh, less adamant about bigger guys. Uh, not long after that, I think Martel got kind of, and I kind of asked him to start using him. That I thought he had some potential, and he turned out to be a pretty good baby face. And then that was kind of the start of it, you know. Tell me about June of '73. Uh, you got a shoulder injury there when you were in Stampede. I was just sort of uh, on my way up, or I was supposed to be having a big title match of some kind that weekend in Calgary. Friday was always our big shows, and I uh, messed up my shoulder in some little spot show, and uh, we had to drive back. I remember that was kind of one of those (laughs) memorable nights, because I blew the engine in my car, and then uh, we're out hitchhiking in the rain, and these two headbangers gave us a ride and I think they had been drinking. They ended up rolling their vehicle <laughs> about 60 miles down the road and uh, and I was lucky to get out of that alive and then I had to hitchhike and uh, I think I ended up calling my dad from some farmer's house and he had to come pick us up about 40 miles out and then I ended up getting surgery and uh, so it was kind of a, one of those nights for you know everything that could go wrong, did go wrong, you know. That that kind of uh, set me back for about a year. I was out for quite a while. It just took a long way to rehab, and then by the time I came came back, I was uh, relegated to to Bronyville for oh. a couple of years, and then uh, yeah, I ended up going to England in '77. And uh, quite honestly, I thought that was kind of almost like I was more kind of discouraged and disenchanted with, you know, just the way my career had been going. And um, I went to England more just for a holiday, you know, like a, a working vacation. And um, when I was over in England, you know, I was taken aback with, uh, they had, uh, most of the workers over there were smaller guys, you know, uh, guys from lightweight and welterweight and middleweight and mid heavyweight and all this other, you know, from about like boxing it was about like from about one hundred and forty pounds and up. And um it was when I was over in England that I you know, I, I saw a bunch of these smaller guys like Adrian Street and some of them, but I mm-hmm. was over there that I ran into uh Tom Billington. You know, and I, who, I do uh, want to talk about your time in the United Kingdom where I believe you wrestled as Bronco Bruce Hart. Yeah, they, they, it was amusing because uh, the promoter over there, a guy named Max Crabtree, he was sort of a, a bit like a P.T. Barnum type, you know, but he a uh, pretty, pretty good manipulator. And, um, and that's Shirley Crabtree's it, brother, correct? Yeah, a Big Daddy, yeah, Shirley's yeah. Uh, a guy, in case any of the listeners think it's a girl. <laughs> but, um, yeah, I remember the first night I got to the... 
Max told me uh, they, they wanted me to be a cowboy over there, so I had to like get the cowboy boots and the uh, the chaps and the hat and the bullshit, you know. And, uh, I remember the first time I went in there, they uh, they had me ride a damn horse in, <laughs> in Manchester, which is like a big uh, Bellevue, which is like like England's equivalent to Madison Square Garden. It was like one of the famous arenas and. Uh, I, I, you know, I'd frankly never ridden a damn horse before, even though we were, <laughs> grew up on the farm. My, my dad never had many horses, it was cows and goats and chickens and Beverly Hillbillies type stuff. But um, I remember the horse spooked, and I'm riding this horse. It seemed fairly, you know, kind of peaceful. And then they opened the curtain, and the crowd roared, and the spotlight, and the horse <laughs> freaked out, and I, it's like galloping down the uh, runway to the ring on, you know, cement floor and uh, and I'm like holding on for, <laughs> for dear life. My big my big uh, debut on TV was like on national TV in Great Britain. Uh, unfortunately, the horse put the brakes on and I uh, was able to dismount at the ring and uh, I think that was the only time I ever had to do the horse entrance, you know, I was like, uh, thank goodness. <laughs> I, that that proved to be a, kind of a turning point in uh, in my career, that whole thing in England. Cause, uh, now, how did that yeah. work? How did you end up getting over there? Was there a, a working relationship with Stu, or was it with the National Wrestling Alliance, or how did that work out? Uh, it's funny, my dad had, had this couple of these old farts. My dad had, you know, uh, earlier in the 70s and the late 60s had, uh, he had brought in a few of these English wrestlers and oddly enough uh, nobody in the States I'm not sure if it was tough to get a green card then or uh, nobody seemed to want uh, have any of them so I remember uh 69 this um Turned out to be a very well respected wrestler, but he basically uh, half begged my dad to book him. One of our guys, one of the guys from uh, Calgary, had run into him in Japan. Um, this guy named Billy Robinson, who you know later on became like considered a, a phenomenal worker, but uh, he was like one of the first English guys to. Uh, you know, get work in North America. He became like a instant hit in Calgary. And my dad had him work with Dory Funk Jr., who was the world champion at that time, and uh, got over like a million dollars. And that seemed to pave the way for a few other English guys to come in, like Les Thornton and Jeff Ports. And um, my dad had this old. Uh, guy who was kind of down on his luck and had been kind of uh, you know, jobbed out in the States and he came up to Calgary named John Foley he was just kind of an undercard opening match type so he called the promoter over there and, uh, and the promoter was big on gimmicks I think one of the biggest gimmicks they had ever had over there was this Indian named Billy Two Rivers and uh, so I kind of benefited from that because they seemed to like the uh, cowboys and Indians type uh, charade over there. So, sure. um, so I, I I I was going over there more, frankly, just to you know do a few matches and get a bit of uh, pocket money from that. And uh, oddly enough, the cowboy thing got over pretty good, and they pushed me way way more than I was ever expecting. That, that turned out to be kind of almost a turning point uh, situation for the whole, certainly for my career, and uh, had a big impact on Calgary because uh, I ran into Dynamite over there and uh, a bunch of these other English guys who uh, were perceived to be way too small to to work in North America, and and none of them were making much money in England, but it was guys like Steve Wright and... Uh, Dynamite and uh, Davy Boy, who later was pretty skinny then, and uh, Calgary became kind of the uh, the gateway for their careers. I, I remember Dave Finley was just kind of young. I saw him over there, and Adrian Street, who uh, wasn't that big at all, but um, 
and those guys were uh, among the best workers of that era. Like anyone who ever saw them would tell you that they're all, you know, some phenomenal workers. Chris Adams was over there. Uh, Marty Jones was pretty good. He's the guy that started William Regal. And there's another couple that probably should have come over. How many America. promotions were over there in the in the UK at that time? Really, just one. It was called Joint Promotions, and they. Uh, mm-hmm. They uh, had two offices, one in London, which is in the south, and one up in Leeds, which is the north. Initially, you know, I thought I'd just go over and work a shot here, a shot there. And next thing I was working six, seven days a week. And I was like uh, going up to Scotland and uh, to Wales and all over the damn place, you know. Amazing. uh, And... uh, Somewhat to my surprise, I got over. Like I frankly wasn't expecting to, as I said before, do much more than just kind of get a you know a shot here, a shot there to pay for my uh, you know trip. I do a bit of traveling, but the weird thing was almost all the rest of us in England. Uh, they, they had this notion of you know they had heard about Billy Robinson's success and and uh, Jeff Ports and Tony Charles and some of those guys. So they. Uh, they thought like Canada was like the land of milk and honey. <laughs> and, uh, I didn't have the heart to tell them that at that time. Cal- you know, Calgary was kind of actually in pretty rough shape. I think my dad was contemplating getting out of the business because business had been bad and wasn't strong in Vancouver. Or, uh, you know, a lot of other places either. You know, and, uh, I didn't even have to sell them. I, they were all like begging me and. Uh, you know, do you think you could get me into Calgary? And I was like, oh, well, I'll, I'll talk to Stu. And I frankly, you know, I didn't have the heart to tell him that business has been kind of not that good over there, you know. And, uh, and that seemed to intrigue the more that I was not really uh, going to any great lengths to book them. And, but uh, I remember when I finally, as I said to you before, I ran into Dynamite, who... Uh, at that time, was about 140 pounds, you know. And, yeah, uh, little. He had, he had some old uh, trainer who reminded me of Mick in uh, the Rocky movie, kind of named Ted. Named Ted, and I remember I met him and Davey the same mm-hmm. night. And uh, this old fart, he uh, he came up to me in this place called Chester in the dressing room, and he was familiar with Billy Robinson and all like that. So he said, I he was like really. Uh, you know, uh, patronizing me to. So I've got two, two lads, as he called them, that I want you to look at, and he's saying they're. Uh, he referred to them as crackers, which is sort of like uh, an English term for that they're exceptional or they're awesome or something like that. Mm-hmm. And, uh, I wasn't sure what he had in mind. He brings these two, and, and they they were really uh, quiet. They didn't say a damn word, dynamite. And the other one was Davy Boy. But they, uh, I ended up actually giving Davy Boy the name Davy Boy later on. At that time, his ring name was just called Young David. And um, anyway, uh, he says, and I you, you got that here. from uh, the British lightweight boxing champion, Dave Boy Green? Yeah, yeah, right around the time that uh, Davy, uh, you know, uh, and it was supposed to come in, uh, you know, I was saying that name just doesn't cut it, young David. <laughs> I was like, didn't really, and I was trying to think, and I heard of Davy Boy Green was fighting Sugar Ray Leonard. Almost, uh, you know, right around the time that Davy was supposed to be coming in, and uh, all of a sudden I said, you know, we'll call him Davy Boy Smith, <laughs> and that stuck, you know, uh, oddly enough, but... Uh, I remember this old Ted Bentley he wanted me to take a look at his so-called protege, and he brings him in, and uh, I, you know, I had a few guys I think, you know, that had pulled ribs on me over there, like uh, you gotta see this guy, and you know, he's like the drizzling shits or whatever, you know. And <laughs> anyway, uh, he says I want you to look at this uh, young Thomas, as he, he called him, and. Uh, Dynamite, uh, anyone who knows him, he's, you know, a, a man of very few words. He never ever, you know, said a word. He, you know, I didn't know that he was shy or, you know, kind of arrogant or what. But uh, so 
city where I said, I'll take a look. You know, I frankly wasn't expecting much, and uh, it was almost uh, unbelievable. You know, he's like, uh, he had an innate ability to uh, know when to turn it on and when not to, and, uh, and uh, I remember I, uh, I wow, <laughs> I finally persisted. My dad was uh, adamant that no 150-pound uh, uh, skinny uh, teenager is going to, uh, you know, have much impact on anything. But I, I, you know, and I think my dad finally uh, agreed to bring him in, almost to uh, prove me wrong. <laughs> but I remember my brother Brett was one of the guys. He was just starting then, and uh, initially we were. If, if you look in some of our old programs at that time, uh, you know, I, I spoke to Dynamite maybe about bringing him in as our cousin, you know, and that's, uh, we talked to him, just bringing him in as Tommy Hart. Mm-hmm. And uh, he was all for that. And then uh, quite a few people in my family were like, no, you know, want some skinny little, you know, uh, nondescript English guy <laughs> with a name and that, <laughs> like whatever, you know. So, um there was some cartoon character in England in the cartoons like uh, Mighty Mouse or, uh, you know, uh, but uh, there's a cartoon strip called Dynamite Kid in England, and uh, that's where wow. the name came from. And you guys you know, even worked in Germany for catch wrestling in 78. Is that correct also, Bruce? At 79, I, um, it's funny, I, I finally got Stu to bring Dynamite in and, uh, and Dynamite, you know, he he was well aware of the, uh, you know, the pre-existing prejudice against smaller guys. I remember when he first, the first night he uh, worked in Calgary, and uh, you know, it's heavyweight territory, so uh, any anyone under two two hundred twenty pounds was kind of the low end, and most of them were like big. Uh, Abdullah, Archie the Stomper, John Quinn, uh, Torquemada types, you know, the big uh, mm-hmm. Killer Khan types, you know, 280, 300 pounds. And uh, so we had Dynamite, he was working with this, uh, you know, heel named Cuban Assassin. I'm not sure if you know him. But, Is that and, Angel Acevedo? Yeah, and he, he, Angel was uh, considered, you know, uh, one of the smaller guys in the territory at that time, but he was maybe about... 225 or so low, you know, kind of mm-hmm. short but stocky, you know, and uh, and Angel was finishing up that night. I think he, they were going to the Maritimes, uh, the New Brunswick for the summer, so my dad said it would be okay for Angel to put Dynamite over, and Dynamite got in, like, uh, the day flew in that day from England, so nobody had even seen him, and I bring him down to the the dressing room and everything's like uh, just some kind of an effing rib or what, you know, this guy's uh, looks like a 130 pound little skinny kid, you know, <laughs> who the hell are you kidding? And Angel was good enough to say, I'll put him over. And everyone, everyone seriously thought, you know, this is uh, going to be one of the worst fiascos you've ever seen. And uh, to Angel's credit, Angel uh, did the job for him, but, Dynamite was like, uh, he was like kind of motivated or he was like half pissed off that, you know, all you assholes think that I'm too small and you think I'm, some kind of, you know, he, he picked up on all the vibes. I think everybody thought this is uh, some kind of a, you know, a, a joke or Bruce Bruce's, you know, uh, perpetrating this hoax with this skinny little English kid and, uh, and uh he had, he had that, anyone who knows Dynamite, uh, and though he had that kind of feisty kind of uh, streak to him, you know. And he went out there and, you know, had a incredible match with Angel, and everyone was like, almost like doing double takes, you know. Initially, the crowd was kind of like half sneering, like, look at that skinny little kid in the, look like a homemade outfit. And, uh, and he, he was like... Uh, Everything you know, the name the name perfectly suited him, Dynamite Kid, you know, and uh, he became like the big catalyst for the uh, 
resurgence of the whole promotion. Initially, he was a baby face, uh, and uh, all of a sudden, Brett, who was just just getting started then, and uh, a bunch of these other guys were all of a sudden like everyone wanted to work with Dynamite. Finally, I, I took John Foley, who was an old retread, and it was right around the same time as the uh, yeah, no, no, Dallas no, TV no. series with J.R. Ewing. So we concocted some story where J.R. Foley, uh, John Foley, inherited a, a fortune, and he became like a, a millionaire manager, and he was, you know, uh, <laughs> buying all these wrestlers, and he turned Dynamite into a heel, which, uh, you know, actually worked out perfect because. Uh, which, which Vince also uh, Brett, stole years Dino. later, right? He gave it to Ted DiBiase? Yeah, exactly. And uh, Dynamite was like one of the uh, cornerstones of the promotion, and then uh, business exploded. My dad and I were never really necessarily on the same page as far as methodology goes, but uh, I remember he, he gave me the book in uh, 1980, I think mostly because... Uh, uh, he had no, no other options. I think um, he had, had my dad in the past always had all these old cronies of his, his bookers like Art Nelson and uh, some old guy named Tiger Tommaso and Dave Rule and guys like that. They're all old veterans, but by that time, most of them had either died or retired or <laughs> and whatever. Uh, so I had a decidedly different approach as a booker I was kind of more uh, you know action oriented and uh, you know I had a little more uh, you know just from having traveled a bit I sort of picked up on different things that seemed to get over that were considered kind of radical in Calgary at that time uh, can you give us an example at that time if you guys you know you guys probably maybe have some awareness of the style back in the 70s but it was kind of bigger slower you know not you know work a whole type thing the old so-called johnny valentine style and uh i think prior to that i i I had been in hawaii before i came back and uh peter my v and them let me do the booking down there and uh i had a lot of success with kind of uh some of the stuff I was advocating, you know, I think everything I was doing was running, you know, kind of a bit of a satirical take on world politics and world affairs and all this stuff, you know. And uh, when I came back to Calgary, my dad almost kind of gave me the book by default. And uh, I don't think he had any great uh, anticipation that. You know, as I said before, he and I weren't really on the same page as far as uh, methodology. And uh, for whatever reason, you know, we, you know, damned uh, business took off. You know, we uh, all of a sudden were like selling out every damn night, you know, uh, day, week in, week out, uh, every damn town. And uh, all of a sudden they had guys like David Schultz, who was a pretty hot commodity at the time, and uh, Bad News Ellen, and... And I had all these Japanese guys begging to come in, like Siam or Tiger Mask. And prior to that, my dad would have been delighted to, you know, have in. And all of a sudden we were like, uh, no, we can't use you, you know, know, all booked up. Almost all the guys we uh, developed during that era were uh, homegrown, but they, they became like huge stars, like Davey Boy. We mentioned that you'd been to Germany. Um, with with Dynamite back in 78. I'm curious to know yeah. what it was like over there. That was, uh, that was an interesting charade over there. Uh, you, you stayed in uh, one place for like uh, 50 days in a row. They had like a so-called tournament. If you ever watched like the Olympics and all the pageantry and the marching in and the and all that yeah. stuff. They're really big on that stuff. They had marching bands and uh, parade music and hmm. all that type of stuff. And uh, in every town, um, we we're in the same town, every, same town every damn day. <laughs> so oh, we, you uh, weren't you weren't just traveling back to that town at night to go to sleep. 
uh, I remember Dynamite and I lived in a damn trailer outside the tent. It was like a big circus <laughs> tent. And uh, we lived in this trailer and uh, it was like right outside. And uh, all the other wrestlers were in trailers around this big, like a big, like, you know, the Ringling Barnum and Bailey Circus or some crap, you know, and uh, the tent held about 4,000 people, and um, they called this tournament the World Cup Tournament, and, you know, a fair number of Americans I remember being over there, Afa and Sika, and, uh, and uh, I think that's where I met Lynn Denton was over there, and they they had all these uh, guys uh, being billed from they made it like everyone was from uh, Australia and uh, different parts of the world they made it out to be like the Olympics most of them were Americans you know uh, junk, I met Junkyard Dog over there he was getting jobbed out his, uh, his name there was Sylvester Ritter which is his real name you know and uh, mm-hmm. Um, you know, they had uh, a bunch of French Canadians and they had them built from all over the planet and all this other stuff, you know, but, uh, but the style, the style of work over there was, uh, three minute rounds like boxing and, uh, that type of stuff. But, uh, it was kind of an eye opening experience and I can't say the level of work was that good, but they had, they had a couple of these old clumsy, stiff, crowbar type German wrestlers who had to uh, win the tournament every year, you know, and uh, <laughs> I think the champion was this guy named Axel, Axel Dieter, and uh, he reminded me of the uh, <laughs> the coyote and the roadrunner, the coyote, you know, <laughs> and he just, <laughs> most of the Americans, uh, like Afan Sika and uh, Junkyard and them couldn't stand him, but they uh, they had to go and put him over. And he was probably about 160 pounds with you know bag of bones and all the other. But he had to go over every night, you know. And the intriguing thing for me about that was there was no no perception whatsoever of, about it being a work. It was uh, perceived quite adamantly to be. A shoot, and they took it very seriously, and they had uh, sports reporters and interviews, and you know, just be about like uh, you know the way they treat UFC these days, or you know, somebody interviewing the uh, NFL players about the big upcoming game, and they'd have all this in the paper and the big showdown tonight with Axel Dieter and Sika. I certainly learned a lot about just about how to uh, market it, you know, kind of uh, create uh, perceptions. It helped me a lot when I was booking. Uh, I picked up quite a bit from uh, some of the other territories I had been in. Uh, I think one of the guys I learned a lot from was Terry Funk and uh, Dory Jr., but more Terry. And uh, When did you go to Amarillo? Uh, well, I was down there in 72, oh 73. Gosh, starting. And uh, there's so quite did a, your dad uh, send you out to a variety of territories, or how did that? How does that work when you're no, a wrestler? I pretty much just did it on my own, you know. And I, uh-huh. Dory Dory Jr. was the world champion in the uh, early '70s there, and he uh, he used to come up to Calgary and a uh, uh, super nice guy, you know. And he invited us to come down to Amarillo. So I remember I went down there with my brother Dean and uh, Brett, who was kind of a skinny young mop haired. Uh, <laughs> Whatever at that then, thirteen, fourteen, maybe fifteen, sixteen, okay. somewhere in there, you know. And uh, so we uh, we drove all the way down to Amarillo from Calgary, and uh, we were kind of like wide-eyed, naive <laughs> headbangers, you know. I think of the, I think back in those days was, uh, you know, you see some of those movies like Easy Rider with the. Uh, generational gap with you know uh, we were considered like long-haired hippies yeah <laughs> you know i think the first time i ever met terry funk i uh i remember they pulled a few ribs on me that first night terry funk had me uh 
I'd never met any. It was the first day we ever got down there, and we were in some place called Lubbock. And uh, I sort of laugh now at how naive and kind of stupid we were back then. But I remember Terry Funk gave me a big, you know, chew of Red Man or whatever. I didn't, like, they didn't have chewing tobacco up in Canada. I didn't even know what the hell it was, you know. But I, huh. uh, so I'm chewing on the damn stuff and. Uh, Terry was driving, and I think he had the heater turned on. It was about 100 degrees outside in the middle of summer any time, but he's got the heater on, and uh, Terry had a, a pop can. I think you know, he's spitting the tobacco juice in it, and uh, yeah. I didn't even, but uh, I, I, didn't, I had no I, I thought he was drinking the pop, and uh, I remember I uh, was sucking on this wad of shit for about half an hour, and all of a sudden I... Uh, Told Terry to pull over and to like barf my guts out, and then, uh, <laughs> but, but Terry told me he had an angle in mind. You know, uh, I think the two guys working that night was some kind of a Russian chain match with Dick Murdoch and this other guy named Boris Malenko, who's a mm-hmm. uh, pretty tough old shooter. And Terry told me uh, at some point in the match, I'm supposed to be like planted in the crowd like uh, a mark, and I'm supposed to like. And Murdoch was uh, the, the face at that time, and Boris Malenko had the uh, his finish was a Russian sleeper hold or some bullshit, and I'm supposed to jump in the ring and piggyback Boris and uh, cause uh, him to lose the match or something. But anyway, I remember I jumped in the ring at whatever the cue was, and uh, I don't think uh, Terry had cued in Boris or Dick whatsoever about any of this and uh, the second I jumped on Malenko's back uh, I could feel him tighten up and uh, he, and I hear Murdoch say what the fuck's going on and um, Malenko's uh, some marks in the ring or something the next thing uh, Malenko's uh, giving me like a stiff head mare and he's got the chain wrapped around his fist and, and I'm going I could sense that there was something I'm going like Terry Funk sent me, and uh, <laughs> and Malenko's going and Terry in his fucking ribs, you know. And, uh, and uh, <laughs> next thing, the cops hit the ring and uh, handcuffed me, and uh, I think uh, they had me in the cruiser. And I remember, I remember, it's like you know, I, I didn't want to expose the business, so I yeah, like, uh, and the cops were, I think they were in on it, but they're all like. Uh, what the hell are you doing, boy? And I was like, one of those, uh, you know, f- fucked up movies from, you know, Deliverance or some shit. And, uh, <laughs> and I finally, old Lord Alfred Hayes, who was a face, comes out. And uh, I, f- I first said, uh, ask Terry Funk, you know, and Terry Funk comes out and says, is that the son of a bitch that... Almost caused a riot <laughs> like this, and uh, he says, "Lock that son of a bitch up and throw the key away or something." <laughs> and I was like, "What the?" <laughs> Finally, uh, Lord Alfred Hayes came out and uh, said, uh, "I beg of you, in that very stuffy English, you know, I think this young lad was just a little, you know, uh, overreactive to the." Excitement, and I beg of you to please give him some lenience or some shit. <laughs> and, and, uh, but yeah, that was like one of my first, the first day I ever met Terry Funk. You know, it's like, uh, but uh, but yeah. That was what other territories my, were you able to to make your way through there as you were coming up in the game, Bruce? I kind of became pretty good friends with old Harley and uh, who, who was uh, kind of part owner of the uh, promotion in Kansas City. He was, I think, world champion at that time. He had beaten Dory Jr. or something like that. And then uh, so I was around Kansas City a bit and uh, a little later with Portland and Hawaii and uh, Japan. And uh, let, me, yeah, let me ask you about Hawaii. So so tell me, tell me what it's like to work there. You go in for... Do you go in for a month at a time, or how does that work? <laughs> I remember my brother Dean, who was uh, kind of, uh, he kind of uh, conned me and Dynamite to uh, go to Hawaii, you know, so it was about, uh, he, was, he had somehow befriended uh, Leah, my via, who was Peter's wife, and uh, 
Rocky Johnson, who had started up in Calgary, so we know him. But that was Peter's son-in-law, The Rock's father. And uh, Dwayne Johnson was down there at that time, too. It kind of uh, had like a a six-inch high square afro or something like that. And and, uh, that was a weird trip, that whole thing in Hawaii, because... Beyond being like the top baby face, Peter Maivia was uh, legitimately like a high chief or some kind of a spiritual uh, spiritual leader or some yeah. such thing. And uh, so I, I remember my brother Keith and I were, uh, you know, the the resident uh, heels. And uh, it was kind of funny because uh, Peter and Rocky Johnson were the the top baby face tag team down there. And almost all the other faces down there were, uh, I mean, they were all like Samoans, like King Tonga. And uh, I remember at that time, they used to call the white guys Howleys. We were like, yeah. uh, and it was pretty pronounced. Like they didn't like <laughs> the white guys. And uh, my brother Keith and I were kind of like these uh, skinny, obnoxious, blonde haired uh how we <laughs> asshole types, you know, and <laughs> and uh, we were having to fight the damn Samoans every damn night, you know, guys like Alpha and Sika and Peter Maivia, and, mm-hmm. and uh, they were kind of half pushing us just because uh, it was part of the storyline, and you had to have some heels. So I think we we were uh, pushed a bit, and. Uh, Fans hated our guts, and uh, we're actually doing a lot of bad job of being assholes or whatever. <laughs> but, uh, but I remember we uh, did a match, and uh, it was a big showdown match with, uh, I think it was Keith and I were wrestling uh, Peter Maivia and Rocky Johnson for the Hawaiian Tag Team Championship or some damn thing. And um, Peter had a he seemed to like to get color or juice, as they call it, you know. And um, Peter uh, set up this finish where uh, we were supposed to bust him open with some kind of uh, foreign object or knuckle dusters or some such thing. And then uh, he was supposed to uh, go back to the dressing room and get bandaged up and do the so-called Spirit of 76 where he... Uh, you know, we were then beating, sure. uh, double teaming Rocky, and uh, I think Rocky was bleeding too, and uh, and Peter was supposed to finally come back and make the big uh, comeback and run us out of the ring and set up a rematch or something. So we got the uh, the heat on Peter, and he uh, he was bleeding. I think he maybe hit an artery or some such thing, and he was like bleeding uh, to the point of. Uh, it looking alarming, and he staggered back to the dressing room, and uh, you know he he was, as I said before, perceived to be almost like kind of a spiritual leader. So <laughs> they're on the edge of a riot, and uh, we were supposed to then get our heat on Rocky, and Peter was finally supposed to uh, come in and run us out. So uh, we'd already got the heat on on. Peter and fans are ready to riot already, and now we're beating the crap out of Rocky and uh, waiting. And Peter's not coming, and all of a sudden I, I notice like the crowd is, you know, all around the ring on the, you know, about ready to start, you know, uh, a big catastrophic riot. And uh, mm-hmm. and uh, Keith and I are like, where the hell's Peter? You know, and you know we're telling Rocky to come back and he's like just uh bleeding and no 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 wait for Peter <laughs> you know I got about two thousand Samoans, all of them who are about the size of Umaga or you know, with these two little obnoxious uh white guys beating the crap out of the high chief and the the son in law, you know, and uh yeah, I finally say to Keith, uh, do you remember that scene from Bush Cassidy and the Suntance Kid? And uh, he's, you know, he's going like, uh, it's a hell of a time to be talking about movie trivia or some shit. <laughs> I said, no, no. I said, no, we're going to uh, pretend like we're, uh, you know, and we're going to brawl our way through the crowd with Rocky, and uh, they'll all part like the Red Seas. And, <laughs> and Keith's going like hell, you know. And I said, we don't have much choice, you know, uh, so 
we we actually did that, and uh, much to my uh, you know, sort of surprise, they they did part, and we brawled our way all the way back to the dressing room, and uh, I guess Peter had lost so much blood he was, you know, uh, you know, uh, unable to make it back in, but that, that was kind of like uh, one of my Hawaii stories, you know. That was, uh, Man. And my brother Owen was down there. He was just on a visit, and some some Owen heard he was uh, related to us, and you know uh, had punched him in the eye, and he had like a big black eye. It was like a, kind of a crazy charade there, though. But uh, a good story. Now I can laugh about it. I wasn't. I don't think I was laughing <laughs> that night, but. Uh, now, how did the work rate go over there? You know, like in England, you said you were able to work every night of the week. Was it the same in Hawaii? They only had uh, he wrestled in uh, two or three places on the on the so-called Oahu. Um, we wrestled out at the Pearl uh, Block Arena in Pearl Harbor, where the the uh, military base, and then there was like uh, some place on the North Shore where the, uh, they had. Uh, there was uh, the Blaisdell Arena, which is like the big arena in uh, Honolulu. And then uh, I think uh, every few weeks we'd go to uh, Maui, somewhere over there, and then I think Kauai once in a while. It sounds idyllic, you know, because uh, you hear those names. But uh, <laughs> I think we were uh, subsisting on beans and uh, <laughs> you know, that kind of I remember Dynamite. He was over there with us. Uh, he, he finally just left, and so I, I think the payoffs were <laughs> like, uh, I think like twenty five dollars a week and crap like that. Jeez. Like, it, it, you know, most of the guys who we worked against were living there, like the Morocco and uh, the General Adnan and uh, you know the other Samoan. I think they they had day jobs as bouncers and shit like that, you know. And then the following year in 1981, you came up to the Pacific Northwest and worked for Don and Elton Owen. Yeah, I had won the uh, the World Junior Heavyweight, which we changed the name to Mid Heavyweight Title in 1980. And uh, did you did you put that belt on yourself, Bruce? You booked yourself to get that belt. No, it was uh, okay. uh, kind of funny. Steinborn, I'm not sure if you know him, of him. He Dickie Steinborn? Of, yeah. He had been working for us in 79, uh, you know, and um, I think acquired it and wanted to know if we had any use for it. And I remember talking to Dynamite. We had, you know, uh, gotten over the, uh, what we call the British Commonwealth mid-heavyweight belt around that time. And, uh mm-hmm. So I remember I said to Steinborn, sure, you know, if you want to come up and drop it, we'll maybe uh, see if it's got any uh, value up here. And so I think Dynamite, I worked in Angle, and uh, the winner was supposed to, we always had the big uh, so-called tournament, the big, it was kind of our version of like WrestleMania up in Calgary at that time called uh, Stampede Week. They call it the greatest outdoor show on earth and the rodeo and all like that. So every year yeah. my dad would always bring up the world champion, like the Dory Funks and the Harleys and the Jack Briscoes, and he'd bring in the girls and the midgets and the Andre the Giants. And it was kind of like the big, you know, kind of blockbuster card yeah. of the year. So uh, we we kind of told Steinborn, sure, if you want to come up and drop the strap that would be cool uh, Dynamite and I worked an angle uh, and I uh, went over and then beat Steinborn the next week and it, uh, it got over you know I think the way we unloaded it was pretty uh, effective and uh, that became all of a sudden the hot belt up here you know and we <laughs> All of a sudden, had other promoters. That's how uh, I think Don Owen. They wanted me to come down and defend the belt with against some guy named Eric Embry down there, who was yeah. one of the, uh, I guess, uh, 
so-called stars down there, and I that's I remember uh, meeting Rip Oliver and uh, I think Dutch and Stasiak. I remember was down there in uh, Sandy Bar and. Uh, How and long were you actually in in Portland working? Um, I was there two or three times. You know, I. Uh, you just come in for I a remember, week stay, or? Yeah, just a week or two. I think among the most impersonated guys in the business was my dad, Jim Barnett, and this guy named Elton Owens. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> I remember all the all the every everybody that ever worked in Portland always used to when they came up to Calgary or wherever else they'd been, they had some kind of an impersonation of Elton Owen. And, uh, so it was kind of funny to meet him. You know, and I can't remember. He ran one town for Don. Yeah, he Owens. ran Eugene, I believe. Yeah, and uh, but it, it was kind of funny because I had heard about all these guys and I had really never met them, but it was kind of almost like a caricature. You know, you hear of Elton Owen and uh, Sandy Barr, and uh, I think there was. Tony Bourne may have been around there then, and uh, I had known Stasiak, and uh, there was a couple of other Samoans that were down there, uh, I think named Tio and Tapu or something like that. Yeah, uh, T- uh, great Tio and Prince Tapu, I believe, yeah. Yeah, and uh, I think, I can't remember if all, I think Martel was there, Piper was there. Roddy yeah, and, Roddy uh, and Ricky were were teaming up right at that time too. Yeah, Rip Oliver and um, a couple, of, you know, all pretty good guys. You know, Bill, uh, later on I met that Billy Haynes, who uh, Schultz had befriended. He was Schultz was down there for a bit after he left Calgary. Yeah. And David Schultz and. Uh, um, there was some other guy named Don White, who was a friend of theirs. They, we brought him up, and he claimed he had been in uh, in prison with Charlie Manson, so we called him <laughs> Charlie, uh, Animal Manson or something like that. It was an interesting place. The uh, I, I, I can't remember if they ran in a bowling alley or it was like some kind of a... Yeah, the old uh, Portland Sports Arena was a bowling alley Don bought and converted. The guys seemed to like the working there. I remember, like, I, the, most of them told me they didn't make huge money there, but the trips were short. Mm-hmm. And they said that Don Owens always treated them pretty good. He's, he yeah. they all spoke well of him. You know, he's a pretty straight up guy or whatever. So, well, and then in uh, in 1983, I know you traveled to the Orient to work for uh, New Japan. With uh, I believe you traveled with Bad News Allen, Tony St. Clair, and Dick Murdoch. Is that accurate? Dick Murdoch and I. I, uh, I can't remember if there's any others. I remember I was there another another tour I did there, and Ray Candy and Leroy Brown and uh, some of those guys were there on that one, and uh, that was all right. You know they, uh, you know they were uh, really endeavoring to oblige us or accommodate us because Dynamite was by that time a huge. Uh, Huge thing in Japan, and so was Davey, and uh, they were uh, basically dumping all their young talent on us, wanting us to develop them. Asakaguchi and Inoki. So I remember I, I <laughs> it's it's almost amusing, but I, I remember uh, there's a bunch of these Mexican, I mean a bunch of these Japs just showed up in the dressing room one night in Calgary. <laughs> and uh, I think the I I gather they had been starving in Mexico, and <laughs> and uh, we had this old uh, Japanese guy who was kind of an agent for the Jap- Japanese office named Tokyo Joe. He had yeah. he had lost his leg in a car accident or something. And he, he used to you know be but. He all of a sudden had brought. Uh, I remember I walked into the dressing room <laughs> without a word of a lie. And at this time, our business was booming. You know, it's like Dynamite and Davy and Schultz and Bad News and all them were in their you know heyday. And uh, but anyway, I walk into the dressing room in Calgary, and I was like the Booker, and uh, there's like about eight Japanese guys that I've never like uh, 
who the hell are these guys, you know, what the, you know, and uh, I had this whole uh, guy had been in, you know, in Calgary for five or six years named Mr. Hito, who was, uh, my dad liked him a lot. He was kind of an old veteran chap, and uh, all of a sudden he's like, uh, you know, could you please, you know, uh, use these guys? And I said, I said, fuck, there's like, Eight of them or something. I said, I said, I said uh, about one percent of our fan base is Japanese. You know, like, you know, there's not any great appeal for them over here or anything. You know, but well, you got them over, right? It's Karachi Vice well, and the Viet Cong Express and, and all that, right? It's funny. I, I said to Hito, you know, and he's like, you know, please, you know, it's like begging me, like it would, uh, it's like uh, the worst thing that can happen to a. A Japanese guy is to get fired or sent home, you know. And so I said to Hito, "Okay, uh, <laughs> this is like in a matter of ten minutes." I said, "Well, I'm going to shape his, you know, he's going to be an Indian." So I had this guy named Georgie Harada who became Sunny Two Rivers, and I gave the Georgie Takano a mask, and he became the Cobra, and uh, had this other big guy named Ozawa. And, we had him as Killer Khan, uh, kind of a big Mongolian, mm. and we had uh, another one named uh, Shunji Takano, who was from Cambodia, and we had another one, of Hiro Saito, who was uh, now a Malaysian playboy, and made him dye his hair blonde, and uh, it's, it's like all in a matter of 15 minutes, these guys were transformed into uh, the United Nations, <laughs> and... and <laughs> But they they were all very appreciative of you know uh, me giving them the opportunity and uh, and they all became pretty big you know pretty useful commodities for us and and it worked well with the guys we had in, in uh, the territory at that time and the styles were compatible like Dynamite and Davy and Brett and uh, and it became a really hybrid style you know we had this uh, kind of uh, mesh of uh, Britain and uh, the Calgary style and a bit of the Southern style. We had a couple of other smaller American guys like Danny Davis and Ken Wayne and uh, a guy named Rotten Ron Starr, who was a pretty good yeah. worker. And uh, a couple of old veterans, uh, Leo Burke and uh, another guy named Duke Myers, who was Portland. And now, I want to backtrack for a second, though, Bruce, before we get into that, that new era of stampede that kind of occurred in the 80s. And I want to talk about the fall of 1984, when your father supposedly, according to the Internet, uh, accepted a buyout from the WWF. And the claim is that he sold Stampede Wrestling for, or the territory for a million dollars plus 10% of all the subsequent gates in Western Canada. Is that true? Yeah, that was, you know, I, I said it before many a time that uh, the Montreal screw job was... Uh, paltry or <laughs> incidental compared to that screw job you know that was uh that was a real piss off for me 